Some CNC projects take hours, some take days or even weeks, and some projects can take years to complete. This is the story of how we built a plywood go-kart. It all started years ago with a goal to create a fully functional go-kart kit that could be made from a sheet of plywood on a CNC router, assembled and driven while powered by a cordless power drill. While the task seemed straightforward, making the dream come true required coming up with unique solutions, dealing with material limitations and redesigning the whole project multiple times. So while making take number 9 of the plywood go-kart, we will share some of the design development process the biggest struggles and the solutions that did and didn't work. For most projects the hard part is coming up with a design that is worth making. This time the challenge was amplified by the fact that we had no idea how to make plywood mechanisms for the steering and the brakes, or how to better transfer the power from the drill to the wheels. So the very first go-kart design was somewhat shot in the dark with the solutions that most likely wouldn't work, but the failures would point us into the right direction. The first prototypes were traditional looking four-wheel go-karts, but the cordless drill wasn't powerful enough to make the cart move, so we had to switch to a three-wheel option. The three-wheel design would have less wheel resistance, be lighter and therefore require less power to drive. The problem was that we had to redesign the whole project and go through the same testing cycles a couple of times until we had found the solution that worked. But more on the design choices later. Now we have to finish up with the CNC operations and can prepare the parts for the assembling. Since the cart is meant for kids, all the component edges must be nice and smooth. So I first trimmed the edges of the larger components on the router table. This time I'm using a 3mm roundover bit. Usually manual tasks like these can get boring quite quickly. However, the unusual shapes of the components made working on them much more enjoyable. When creating the design, I try to make each component in a way that it looks great not only in the assembly, but also individually. Some of the parts were too small to work on the router table, so smoothening the edges required doing a little bit of sanding. But after all the parts were ready, it was time for the assembling. Since one of the first mechanisms we worked on when designing the go-kart was the steering, let's assemble it first. The current design has only one wheel in the front, which in comparison to the first design is way less complicated. Assembling the latest version required trapping the ball bearing between the steering base components and attaching them to the steering axis. To ensure the bearings are held tight in the steering axis, we made the fork and the steering wheel holder components slightly larger than the bearing inner diameter. So before attaching them to the parts, I had to make a few corrections with a chisel to ensure a precise and tight fit. When that was done, I could slide one of the bearing assemblies onto the fork component and the other one onto the steering wheel axis. Then I could join the axis parts together. Since the half lap joint we used for the steering axis is quite long, and cut without any tolerances the assembling required using clamps. But in this case the tight joint is good. So after the steering axis is assembled I can add the front cover component which concludes the main part of the steering mechanism. It's a very simple solution but getting to it wasn't easy. The very first steering design concept required different solutions, rack and pinion gears, rigid wheel mounts and power transfer mechanism. With every next go-kart prototype the steering mechanism was simplified and improved till we got to where we are now. Anyway, it's time for us to attach the steering mechanism to the go-kart main body. But before we do that, we first have to insert the floor panel to one of the frame sides. After we can attach the steering mechanism. You might be wondering why the components have so many cutouts. Well, the main reason is the weight reduction. The lighter the go-kart, the less power it needs to move. And that's very important since we are using a cordless power drill as the engine. After the main body is assembled, we can secure the joinery with a bunch of screws. This time I'm using stainless steel screws. They are not only better for outdoor use, but they also look beautiful. The hardest section of the project was coming up with a good way to transfer the power from the cordless drill to the back wheels. For the first prototype we attached the drill to a gear assembly that would transfer the rotation directly to the wheel axis. But it turned out the drill couldn't move the cart. So we had to use multiple gears to reduce the input power needed. Of course it would also reduce the speed. But the first priority is getting the go-kart moving. 
After testing out different gear ratios and assembly solutions, the go-kart could drive. The only problem was getting the components to stay in place while driving. In the previous design we made the gear axis out of plywood, which wasn't as simple to secure in place. To fix that I wanted to try out replacing the axis with a threaded rod and using different types of nuts to secure the bearings and the gears in place. I knew the gear ratios would work, however I'm not too sure about the axis. For this assembly I'm using an M8 stainless steel rod to which I will attach the ball bearings and of course the gears. The bearings are secured in place with plywood components. This also aligns the threaded rod axis properly. In the middle of the first axis we have attached a smaller size gear. It will transfer the power to the larger size gear on the second axis, this way reducing the necessary input power by a factor of 2.75. At the end of the second axis we are attaching another smaller size gear which would connect to the larger gear at the wheel axis, again reducing the input power necessary. I glued an extended nut to the power axis using high strength threaded glue. It will join the gear mechanisms to the cordless drill, but more on that later. Once the gear module is assembled, we can attach it to the go-kart's frame components and align the gears properly. This required loosening the flange nuts that are holding the gears, making the adjustments, retightening the nuts and re-securing the gears. Before we can secure the gear mechanism between the go-kart frame, we have to assemble the brake module. As with the most of the other mechanisms, the brakes have evolved quite a lot with every prototype. For the first kart, we used the complex scissor mechanism brakes, which didn't work at all. There were too many moving parts. After the first failed attempts, we tested out different handbrake options and simplified the design as much as possible. So now we have to secure a brake disc between two ball bearings and the back wheel support components. When the brake assembly is completed, we can attach it to the frame components and add the other go-kart's frame part. Then we can secure the assembly by adding a couple of screws. Since the components are made out of 9mm thick plywood, we have to pre-drill each component to prevent the screws from breaking the parts. After the pre-drilling, we could countersink each hole to ensure the screws are flush with the surface. Once the back assembly is complete, we can attach it to the main frame. The assemblies are joined with the simple half lap joints. And with a couple of screws added to the floor panel, we are ready to work on the wheels. Just like the other assemblies, the wheels have evolved quite a bit. The biggest update is the tire components. For the first prototypes, we used a ring cut out of rubber tiles. It worked quite well, however, making them required water jet CNC, which might not be freely available everywhere. So to create the rubbers for our wheels, we decided to use the same approach as we did when updating our caster wheel design, making a mold and injecting a rubber sealant inside. Of course, this time the mold had to be way bigger than the one we used for the caster wheels. But the concept was the same, so we made a larger base part to which we could attach the mold walls, creating both the inside and the outside of the tire. Then we can spray it with WD-40 as a mold release spray, inject the sealant inside the mold and wait for it to cure. After two days of curing, we can cut off the excess rubber, remove the mold walls, since we have only two large molds and one small front wheel mold, we had to go through this process three times to make all the necessary tire rings. And once we had all of them made, we could proceed with assembling the wheels. The first step was adding a bunch of dowels to one of the back wheel rims. Then we could attach these small components to the dowels. These will support the tire rings and ensure the wheels are nice and round. Since we will use three rubber tire rings per wheel, we add three levels of the support parts. After all of them were installed, it was time to attach the rubber rings. To secure them in place, I glued the first tire part to the rim with the same sealant we used for the tires. Then I could glue the second tire ring to the first one and to the tire supports and do the same for the final tire part. Then it was just a matter of adding a little bit of sealant to the third tire ring and attaching the wheel rim to the assembly. Just like that we had the first wheel complete and we could make the second one. We had to go through the same steps as before, adding the dowels, attaching the rubber support parts, 
gluing the tire rings and securing the other wheel component to the assembly. However, before repeating the assembly steps for the front wheel, we first had to secure a ball bearing in each rim. After installing the bearings, we glue a small component to the rim to cover the bearing. When the bearings are secured, we can repeat the same wheel assembling steps as for the rear wheels. Now the wheels are completed and it's time to attach them to the axis. Starting with the back wheels, I'm attaching the assemblies to the wheel axis. To secure the rims, we are using flange nuts. The idea is to secure each wheel's rim component between two flange nuts, which presents some challenges when installing the wheel. The flange nuts that have to be placed inside the wheel are quite challenging to attach to the axis. There is not enough room to hold the nut and catch the thread. But after a couple of minutes of struggling, I managed to install the first wheel and tighten the flange nuts to secure the rims to the wheel axis. Then it was just a matter of attaching the other back wheel to the axis. Again, adding the flange nuts in the rim was a challenge. But once they were in place, securing the wheel wasn't that difficult. However, attaching the front wheel was a little bit easier, since all we had to do was slide the axis through the wheel and secure it with a couple of lock nuts. The trickiest part is to get the wheel right in the middle of the axis, but once it's done, we can add a flange nut to both ends of the front wheel axis and attach the wheel support components. Then it's just a matter of attaching the assembly to the steering mechanism and securing the wheel supports in place. When that is done, we can secure the axis in place by adding another flange nut at the ends of the axis. Making the wheels was a lot of work, but they turned out looking incredible. Let's continue by attaching the steering wheel to the assembly. The steering wheel was one of the components that had to be redesigned a couple of times, mostly for aesthetic purposes. This time we ended up with an elongated steering wheel. The shape of the steering wheel is not only as simple as possible, but it also matches the shape of the handbrake. Speaking of which, one of the last tasks is attaching the brakes to the go-kart frame. But before we do that, we have to assemble the brake axis. Simply put, add a couple of washers and brake mounts on a screw with a handbrake component in the middle and attach a lock nut to secure the assembly. Then we can attach the brakes to the back frame of the go-kart. Considering the mount joints and the space is quite tight, installing the brakes wasn't as easy as I expected. However, I soon realized I could use screws to pull the brake assembly joints in the frame component mortises and it worked wonderfully. You might be wondering if the brakes would be able to stop the go-kart when needed. The thing is, once you stop accelerating with the power drill, the drill's motor resistance is breaking the cart as well, so the brakes doesn't have to be that big. To show you how it looks, we first have to assemble the pedal mechanism and attach the drill to the gear assembly. So I attach two hooks to the pedal transfer stick and slide the assembly through the hole in the go-kart's frame. Then I can insert the pedal component. The acceleration would work by pushing the pedal forward. To ensure it slides correctly and delivers consistent results, we have to attach a couple of guides that will hold the mechanism in place. Once those are installed, we can add a rubber band to back frame component and join it with a hook on the pedal transfer stick. The rubber band will pull the pedal back once you stop accelerating. This is exactly how simple the pedal mechanism works. After multiple failed attempts at creating complicated pedal transfer systems, we learned that the best approach is to make things as simple as possible. This way fewer things can malfunction or break. Joining the drill to the gear mechanism is as simple as attaching a socket spanner to the power drill and securing the spanner to the extended nut on the gear mechanism. After giving the power drill a quick go, everything seems to be working great, at least at first. Once I push down on the go-kart, the wheels stopped spinning. It turns out the flange nuts aren't enough to secure the gears in place. To fix this, I decided to glue the flange nuts to the rod and the gears to the flange nuts. So I used the same red threaded glue for the nuts, but for the gears I decided to try out this epoxy glue. It took 20 minutes or so to glue all of the gears in their positions. Both glues should be enough to secure everything together. Once the glue had set, I had to give the gear mechanism another go. The glue did indeed work. However, this time there was the same problem with the wheel. The flange nuts couldn't keep the assembly together on their own, so I added some of the thread glue to the flange nuts and the epoxy glue for the plywood parts. 
and the gear test after the glue had set was a success. So we could secure the power drill to the go-kart frame with a couple of zip ties and a string to the frame's back component and join it to the hook on the pedal mechanism. Now when we push the pedal forward the go-kart starts to move, which means we are almost ready for the first drive. The only thing left for us to do is assemble the seat for the driver. When designing the seat we kept the same simple is better philosophy. So it only has four frame components, a seat and a backrest. And attaching it to the go-kart is even easier than assembling it. We can just place the seat into the cutouts in the frame components. And it's time for the family kids to have their first test drive and enjoy the take 9 of the go-kart project. It still has some improvements that need to be made before sharing the design files with the world. But that's a story for another time. Thank you for joining us on the go-kart project and supporting our work throughout the years. And of course thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.